to place this evening within context is there were a couple of questions that was raised at the last meeting. And so I wanted to provide the information to further provide clarity uh, in regards to how I answered the questions. And the questions had to do with whether or not colleges are looking for well-rounded students and whether or not colleges are offering admissions to multiple students from the same high school. So I think when I put up the information, it would clarify that for everyone. The other thing that I believe this provides a context for is that when we talk about developing a resume, the real goal has to be to develop an exceptional resume. Now, the way that you develop an exceptional resume is you are setting goals when you enter high school in regard to what you want to look like when you leave high school. So why I said to another parent, it is important that you drag your children to these sessions with you because though they're the ones who have to set the goals. They're the ones who have to uh, uh, pursue some sort of plan. And so let me say this to all the young people who are here to give you an example of how this works. One of the young ladies who is in our cohort in Georgia, we started working with her before she started ninth grade. So she started ninth grade and she set some very important goals. The first goal that she set was, I'm going to take the most rigorous classes available in my high school. That was the first one. The second goal she set was, I am going to earn straight A's in the most difficult classes offered in my high school, first semester of ninth grade. And then the third goal she set was, I am going to ensure that I'm going to be a, a great track and field athlete across my four years of high school. So back in December, we were working with students and identifying summer programs. So in December, one of the summer programs that she identified was a Harvard University um, uh, diversity project, debate council diversity project. And that's a project that Harvard University sponsors, and they identify a group of high school students who are going to participate in this program over the scope of four years. Now, to apply to the program, each student had to create a two-minute video uh, and submit along with their application. So here's how it all came together. When she submitted her video and her application with her resume, she distinguished herself so much, she was one of only two ninth graders accepted into the program. So now she will be in this program over the course of four years of high school because she started high school with a plan. The real tragedy in the work that I do is that every year high school seniors are trying to go backwards. They now regret, I didn't take the right classes, I didn't earn the right grades, I didn't set the right goals, I didn't distinguish myself, and so then now they're in a very bad situation in terms of the money. These sessions are not about simply getting accepted into college. Every student in this room, no matter what their grades and test scores, can get accepted somewhere. For-profit colleges are open admission to anyone who can pay or take out enough student loans to pay. State universities are tiered. NC Chapel Hill is up at the top of the tier. Other NC institutions are lower on the tier. But none of them are offering very much by way of scholarships, which means you can get accepted, but it will cost your parents thousands of dollars over the scope of the six years it takes you to get your degree because you weren't engaged in the process. So to address what happened or questions at the end last week, the question was from one student who came to me at the end and said, Mr. Wynn, I heard. I want, to, I want to say this again for all the young people. Whenever a young person says to me, I heard, I can always tell you who they heard it from another young person who didn't know anything. So she said, I heard that colleges are looking for well-rounded students. So this question, I'm gonna piggyback on the parent question, which was, is it true that a limited number of students are offered admission from any individual high school? So as I played this admissions video of admissions counselors talking about students who they're going to extend offers to, I want everyone in the auditorium to listen for the sentence or the statement they make that they're looking for well-rounded students. When they were reading the student profiles, did you hear what they were saying? Exceptional. First chair. Five was on, on all the AP exams. 
We wound, we, we had to narrow our pool down to a thousand students. Amherst College only offers admission each year to about 472 young people. So that's a thousand that made it through the 9,500 who applied, and they're in the room at the end. So your resume, your application, your body of work speaks for you in that room. Your mom and dad are not going to be in that room speaking for you. Your high school counselor may speak for you through a recommendation or an evaluation, but it is your body of work that's going to be in that room. Our older son graduated from Amherst College. Last year, we had two of the students that we're working with uh, offered admission to Amherst College. One student here in Guilford County has already been admitted. She was admitted early decision. The year before, we had two students. That was two students out of 472 who were actually offered admission. So what I want every young person, particularly in this room, to understand is that colleges are not looking for well-rounded people. Colleges are looking for exceptional people in something. And I'm not telling you that you have to be exceptional in everything, but I'm telling you, if you spend four years of high school and you're just dragging along, not doing much, and you are not distinguishing yourself in anything, you're only hurting your own chances. Here's what it looks like when colleges offer admission to a class. This is Williams College. We have students who are at Williams College. Williams College last year offered admission to 35 students in the state of North Carolina. The state of North Carolina has 1,084 high schools. So now you can understand why it is um, rare that these major institutions are going to offer admission to even out of the best high schools more than, to more than two students in a particular high school. I wanted to share this, Stanford University. Last year, they, off, they had 44,000 applications and they, offered, they admitted 2,085 students. Now, the 2,085 students, 1,200 came from public school, 600 came from private school, a little over 260 came from international, and then there were 10 students out of 44,000 who were homeschooled. But then within these numbers, you can even look at your racial group to look at your chances of being offered admission. Because at Stanford University, the African-American population is 6%. It rarely changes from year to year. So all you have to do is do the math. All you have to do is go backwards. If you, if you are black, Stanford last year offered admission to 109 black students from throughout America. That's an admission rate of less than a quarter of a percent based upon the 44,000 applicants. If you're white, they offer it one, you, the admission rate for white students was 1.5%. For Asian, 0.86. For Hispanic, 0.66. So whatever demographic group you're in, is it, it's it. You don't get to change. It is what it is. But when you look at these kind of numbers, and that your child says to you, I want to go to Stanford, but I ain't got time to go to that uh, that college planning meeting tonight. I got other more important things to do. I want to go to Harvard. Harvard rolls off of every tongue all over America. When I go to a public high school, I guarantee you someone is going to tell me they want to go to Harvard. I published on my Facebook feed today. I told you all to friend me on Facebook. On my Facebook feed today, I posted the Harvard numbers. Harvard had 44,000 applicants last year. So this is serious stuff. And these are daunting numbers. You have a better chance of making it to the NFL if you play college football than you do getting accepted into Stanford. So whenever a teacher says, well, you shouldn't want to go to the NFL because that's highly unlikely, the teacher might as well tell you the same thing about Stanford and Harvard and Yale and Princeton. So you need to have a plan. That's my point. Here what the numbers are so that we're all clear. So no one leaves the room saying Mr. Wynn didn't know what he was talking about. The U.S. Department of Education tells us there are 24,651 public high schools. There are 3.3 million public high school seniors. 1.5 million will apply to four-year colleges. Stanford will only offer admission to 1,201 of the 1.5 million students from public schools who apply. And a good number of those students will come from California. 
So do I have everyone's attention for this evening? How are you all doing? Here we go. I want to just look at the metrics because I want the young people to understand this. I don't want to discourage you from having aspirations, but I, I really need you to understand as we move into the resume part why you must set your own goals. Colleges don't hide admission data. They brag about admission data. So at Stanford University, they brag about we want students to maximize the opportunities in their high school. What that means for all the parents who are dreading AP course taking is that if your child attends a high school that offers three AP classes and your child takes all three classes, then your child took 100% of the opportunities. If your child attends a high school that offers 21 AP classes and your child took three AP classes, that means your child doesn't look as good as a student who came from the other high school who took 100% of the course taken. Does everyone understand what I'm saying on that one? If your child attends a high school that offers a specialized program in the arts, and your child tells everyone, I love art, but your child doesn't take advantage of the program in the arts that's offered in their high school, and co colleges are going to question their commitment. Stanford University, the median SAT scores are 730 on each section and 32 on the ACT, which means students, if you say you want to go to Stanford and you're not an exceptional skater, a volleyball player, basketball player, soccer player, any of that, and your SAT and ACT scores are too low, then you don't need to sweat it. What you then need to do is say, I'm going for test optional. There are over 1,000 test optional schools in America, which means that you can find great colleges, some of the best colleges, but that means that you have to seriously think through this whole concept of planning. Teacher evaluations, if you are a 9th, 10th, or 11th grader, it is in your best interest to get to know two teachers at your high school who love you. And then when it is time to ask for an evaluation, you want to go to those two teachers who love you. Because on a common application, there's a box where you check, I don't have to see the evaluation. But when you have a teacher who loves you, that teacher says, I know you, don't, you checked that you don't have to see it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because then you get to use that evaluation over and over and over for every scholarship and every college that you apply to. You need to get to know your counselor, and many high school students don't even know their counselor's name until they're a high school senior. Do you know it's much more difficult to make an impression on someone that you're a great person when you've avoided them for three years, and you show up just when you need something? I need, I need. I want all the students to understand this whole concept of service, that when you serve other people, then when you need something, those people are more willing to help you. I try to impress that on my own children. There will come a day when you want something from me. What you do between now and that day will determine if I give it to you on that day. Young people oftentimes don't understand that concept, and that's a very important concept. So anyway, you can see the data. This is printed uh, in your handout. The financial aid policy at Stanford is printed in your handout. And let me make sure that everyone is clear on this. Part of your plan must be to identify financial aid policies that are aligned with your family income. So for example, at Stanford, if your family income is less than $65,000, Stanford is going to give you almost all of the money you need to meet that $68,000 bill. Now, if your family income is over $200,000, then they're going to give you far less. You can figure all this out in the ninth grade so that as a family working as a team, you're planning the financial piece and you're planning the resume and you're setting goals together as a family. And so to just put a pin in this issue about what selective colleges are looking for, they're looking for exceptionality. So if you are an exceptional athlete, you have an advantage, exceptional musician, exceptional computer programmer, Exceptional, exceptional in theater. Uh, they're looking for students who engaged in research, created their own nonprofit, 
They've had an impact on their community. They want students who've demonstrated grit in the face of enormous obstacles, homeless, natural disasters, refugees, death of the parent, disability, an immigrant, students who have exceptional letters of recommendation, students who have compelling essays. So if there's one word I want everyone to take away with them tonight. It is exceptionality. Just what is it that you can do between now and the time you apply to college to be exceptional at something? This film, Two Million Minutes, profile the difference in attitudes between American students and students from foreign countries who are part of the international pool of applicants applying to U.S. colleges and universities. I want you to listen to what the students say, uh, as well as the narrators in this clip. America is, uh, is the one country in the world that doesn't seem to recognize that it's in competition for the great minds in the capital of the world. Looks like the American student's life is like, a, you know, almost a dream. It's like no studying, very light syllabus. Uh, my mom has always said that college was kind of a big, uh, a big step. I want to join a sorority, which obviously, um, you're going to party a lot, you have some fun, tailgate, do some crazy stuff, so. In terms of the value that Americans add to this increasingly integrated global economy, uh, Americans are adding relatively less and less. Um, there's a chance that I'll actually have to start putting more effort into schoolwork. America has some real challenges now. Everyone uh, else is catching up. Um, but uh, I always just kind of trying glasses if I'm bored. No, math question I could answer it like you know a few seconds when I was a kid. We're having a pop quiz today. It's over calculator. 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 Structurally, the American education system is broken. How a student spends their time during high school affects their entire economic future. And by extension, a country's economic future is dependent on how its students collectively spend those valuable high school minutes. Well, obviously, if the world is completely flat and the people in India and China are lower wages and are just as good as us, we are in a real problem. Sorry for showing this clip is not to indict American public education. My point for showing the clip is to ask the young people, if students in other countries are working harder, earning higher grades, having, submitting higher test scores, I want you to get a sense of your competition to get into U.S. colleges and universities, which is critical because you have the same two, min, two million, I mean, pardon me, two million minutes that you're working with as all the other students everywhere in the world. You have the chance. I also want to say this to parents. Again, can't, can't help but going back to this, this point about students who don't want to come. There was an article in Higher Education uh, that was released uh, last week. I posted this to my Facebook page as well. A student from China, I believe it was China, it was either China or Japan, paid a consultant in the U.S. one and a half million dollars to get their child into a highly selective college or university. Now, if someone in another country is paying uh, one and a half million dollars to get their child into one of the American universities, and the Guilford Parent Academy is offering free workshops, do you see how we should not be wasting that opportunity? Do you all, do you all understand what I'm saying? Okay, so all the students who said to you tonight, I don't want to go, in the next session next month, drag them down here. So the question is, are you pursuing exceptionality? And I'm saying to the young people, you decide. You decide where you want to pursue your exceptionality. 
but I want to share with you some examples. I may not play all of the clips, but I, I want to stimulate your thinking and I want you to self-reflect. So as I share examples of these students, you reflect on where your passions are. What are the things you truly enjoy that you could become exceptional in? My name is Calvin Do, AKA DJ Focus. A white, a white. It's the youngest DJ, DJ Man Focus. I'm from Sierra Leone. And I love inventing. Calvin is extraordinarily talented. He literally goes to trash cans, finds broken electronic parts in the garbage and makes stuff on his own. He's taught himself how to do incredibly intricate things with very, very little resources. In Sierra Leone, we have not too much electricity. Lights will come um, once in a week and uh, the rest of the month dark. So I made my own battery to power lights in people's houses. Calvin represents learn by making. <laughs> he takes a part, looks at it, tries to reverse engineer it. I made my own FM radio transmitter. He made his own FM station because he wanted to give voice to the youth. He made his own generator because he needed it. The generator supply current to the radio station. This is the capacitor and this is the spark plug. This tree, this is his first time leaving his family's home. This is his first time leaving Sierra Leone. And it's tough, but it's an opportunity to create the future that he wants to live in. MIT flew this young man from Sierra Leone, Africa, to MIT in Cambridge, Mass. All expenses paid because he had demonstrated exceptionality in his community and in his passions. When you compare Brooke to the average climber that's her age, there almost is no comparison. I'm Brooke Rabatou, I'm 11 years old, and I'm a rock climber. I started climbing probably about when I could walk. She wants to climb the hardest route out there. She wants to win the competitions. She's able to do climbs that people once thought were impossible. When I'm on a high rock, I feel I'm in control and just happy. Okay, now you understand her life has nothing to do with grades, course taking, or SAT or ACT scores. She's she is exhibiting exceptionality in her area of passion. My name is Santiago Gonzalez. I'm 14 and I love to program. Santiago is crazy about computers. I'm fluent in about a dozen different programming languages. Thousands of people have downloaded my apps for the Mac, iPhone, and iPad. From sixth grade, he jumped to a full-time college student. I will be 16 when I graduate college and 17 when I finish my master's. I really enjoy learning. To me, I find it as essential as eating. Either you die or you're pretty miserable without learning. This guy is programming apps for your cell phone. What I'm saying is that you have opportunity all around you to do any of these types of things. But maybe that's too difficult. What about this one? My life would be impossible without music. Right. Playing the cello gives me a chance to express all my emotions, and I do it in different pieces. It's like, it's singing. Sajari is by far one of the most exceptional students I've ever had. You hear what she said? I told you the words for the night. Repeat it for me, please. Thank you very much. On this next clip, these students, they're just doing something different, but they're doing it with so much passion. I'm so proud of my next guest. 
They're three young women who are determined to change the world, one word at a time. They're part of a nonprofit organization called Get Lit, a program here in Los Angeles focused on teaching teens literacy through poetry. They recently opened for John Legend at the Hollywood Bowl, and now they are here to share their powerful performance with us. Please welcome Melissa, Zaria, and Rhiannon. State. They have a set of standards for every subject, a collection of lessons that the teacher is required to teach by the end of the term. But the greatest lessons you will ever teach us will not come from your syllabus. The, the greatest, greatest lessons, lessons you will ever teach us, you will not even remember. You never told us what we weren't allowed to say. We just learned how to hold our tongues. Now somewhere in America, there's a child holding a copy of Catcher in the Rye, and there's a child holding a gun. But only one of these things have been banned by their state government, and it's not the one that can rip through flesh. It's the one that says F you on more pages than one. Because we must control what the people say, how they think. And if they want to become the overseer of their own selves, then, then we'll show them a real one. And somewhere in America, there's a child sitting at his mother's computer, reading the homepage of the KKK's website. And that's open to the public, but that child will have never read To Kill a Mockingbird because, because the school has banned it for its use of the N-word. Maya Angelou is prohibited because we're not allowed to talk about rape in school. We, we were taught that just because something happens doesn't, doesn't mean you are to talk about it. it. They build us brand new shopping malls so, so that, that we'll forget Forget where we're really standing on the bones of the Hispanics, on the bones of the slaves, on the bones of the Native Americans, on the bones of those who fought just to speak. The most important skill that colleges are looking for from incoming students is communication. They're looking for communication through your writing and through your speaking. When you look at the admissions officers who speak on clips on YouTube, about the types of students they're looking for in their freshman class. What you will invariably hear is, oh, I can see that student sitting in the seminar with his hand raised, just engaging. That is not the way that most of our classrooms are working. In most of our classrooms, our students can sit in there the entire 45, 55 minute period or a 90 minute block and not talk at all. What I see oftentimes when I'm working with young people, particularly in open forums like this, is they have questions, but they're embarrassed to raise their hand. But then when you apply to selective schools, you are going to be interviewed. One of our students this past week has been interviewed by Yale, Brown, and Harvard. If he was not prepared with the skill set to go through those interviews, the students who are recommended, nominated for the Torch Scholarship at Northeastern, Next month, they're flying up to Boston to be interviewed. So all of these are critically important skills that you're going to have to develop. So the question for all the young people is, who are you? I mean, I need you to only think about you. I'm not asking you to be like any other students in any of the clips, but for you, what is your best gift? And what I want to ask the parents is, on the drive home, talk to your young person about his or her best gift. Become exceptional in that gift. It may not have anything to do with school. One of the eighth graders that I'm working with, uh, last week we had a meeting and he said, Mr. Wynn, I just love to cook. And so what I said to him, I said, man, if that's it, we'll make that your hook. What you need to do is to become, understand cooking on an intellectual level. The chemical compounds that go into cooking. Why a certain temperature has to be reached the makeup of the spices. By ninth grade, you can publish a book of resume, I mean, a book of recipes. By 10th grade, you can do a different type of recipe. By 11th grade, you will publish your third book of recipes. And then by 12th grade, when you apply to college, you will have distinguished yourself as being exceptional. So then what is your greatest potential? Here's one of the issues with young people, particularly young men, but it's not, young men are not exempt is that when I go around the country, all the young men want to play basketball and football. I mean, there's nothing wrong with basketball and football, but what if God bless you with gifts to write poetry? What if writing, that's what I am. I played basketball, I played, I played all the sports as a kid, but my gift, my gift was poetry. I started writing poetry in the second grade. I mean, when I applied to Northeastern University and on my application, I told them how much I had a passion for poetry. And they looked at me as a first generation student coming out of poverty in the south side of Chicago. They said, this brother's a poet. 
He's going to the top of the admission pool. If I would have been a basketball player, how many other black guys do you think are trying to get into college playing basketball? How many poets are trying to get into college? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying whatever your gift is, truly develop it, and then what opportunities have you taken advantage of to lead, to serve, and to compete with your gift? For example, if you're a writer and you volunteer to work with elementary and middle school students, you're taking your gift and you're serving the community. If you're an athlete, and you're volunteering to do a summer camp with elementary and middle school students, you're taking your gift and you're serving the community. Uh, if you're a high performing student and you volunteer to tutor students at a low performing school, you're taking your gift and you're using that to serve the community. These are all important because these become resume items on your resume. Here's where you start. And so you can look at this on your handout if you can't see the screen is that under education, I'm saying to all the young people, you have to have academic goals. And your goals should align with the type of college aspirations that you have. If you're trying to get into an exceptionally se selective and competitive college, then you should have exceptionally, exceptional academic goals. On this resume, this student started ninth grade Focus on being a straight A student throughout high school. So when she got to the end of high school and she was applying to college, she was a perfect 4.0 on a 4.0 scale, and her, her class rank eventually became number two out of 480, and her ACT score of 33 is in the 99th percentile. Community service, where would you serve, how would you lead, and how will it connect to your overall self-identity? And again, you control this. You can serve at your school. You can serve at the place that you worship. You can serve in your community. But you get to choose where would you serve. But the, the, the real uh, goal that you have to set for yourself is you need to serve. And that service needs to be sustainable. Not you wait until 12th grade to join a bunch of clubs and to serve. It's about sustained service over the scope of your four years of high school. So this, stu this student served at her church. She was president of the 4-H club. She created her own ACT prep club. She was an ambassador at her high school, and she was an assistant instructor and middle school tutor in a summer math program for several years. Again, all of these were goals that she set in terms of what she wanted her resume to look like. Under your activities, Will your activities focus around school, your faith, or a community? Will your in-school and summer activities, activities demonstrate a consistent focus and sustained involvement? Will you, be, will you focus on developing your passions, supporting your family, or performing service? The point that I'm making is that you choose, but you must make a choice. This should not be happenstance. Choose where you're going to serve and what you're going to do, and for this student, her activities were largely focused around her school and her church. This section, honors and awards, is something that you all are going to have to give a lot more thought to. If you worship somewhere and you are involved in ministries where you worship, you need to talk to the ministry leaders where you worship to come up with some awards to recognize you. My wife and I are the education ministry leaders at our church, Turner Chapel AME Church in Marietta, Georgia. We've been the education ministry leaders for 10 years. The young people who support our ministry, they are education ministry youth ambassadors. They are on the education ministry youth ambassador board. They are recognized with awards. And so they have a lot of awards in this honor section on their resume. If you're involved in a club or an activity at school, you need to talk to your advisor and say, how can I be recognized? I mean, I'm putting in all this time every year. We need to come up with some awards to recognize all the work that students are putting in. I mean, that's shared collaboration. If you're going to go through and the only thing that you can put on your resume at the end of high school is perfect attendance, that's not bad. But do you understand that you have to be better? Do you understand that? You can't just come to school and say, hey, look, Celebrate me, I was here. <laughs> so on this student, 
The student received awards across her brand. Her brand really is academic achievement, over the top academic achievement. She was an AP scholar with distinction that's based upon her AP exam performance. She was a QuestBridge scholar. QuestBridge is a program that specifically targets students from lower income backgrounds and uh, provides access to the most selective schools in the country. At our church, we offer an award uh, for the highest GPA in grades six through 12 for males and females. That's another award that we came up with as education ministry leaders. This young lady was the first time, seven time winner at our church. In third grade, she said, I wanna get the Marcus Award when I enter sixth grade. In sixth grade, she got it, and everyone else knew that the race was over. In seventh grade, in eighth grade, in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, so again, she decided what her brand was going to be, and here's what it means. It's one thing to be accepted in a college. It's another thing to get the money. So what it meant for her is that she was accepted at, into Amherst College that only accepts 14% of applicants. That was a video that I showed you. Her scholarship was worth $246,000 over four years. She was accepted to Duke. Scholarship was worth $250,000 over four years. Princeton, $216,000 over four years. Um, Vanderbilt, $210,000 over four years. Washington and Lee, $232,000 over four years. And Williams College, which is where she's attending school, $243,000 over four years. What is the lesson to be learned from Kimberly's story? Is that she entered ninth grade for the final four years of a seven-year plan. So for those of you who have a young person who didn't want to come tonight, who's already in the ninth or the 10th or 11th grade, you got to ask yourself when you leave, when are they going to start planning? Those people who fail to plan, they're planning to fail. This is what, and again, you have this as a handout, and you have this as a template. Uh, this is what her resume looked like. But again, she got to define it. The reason there are no descriptions under any of these activities is that she doesn't have any room for any descriptions to keep it on one page. But the one thing that you want to make sure that you have on your resume is you want to make sure you recognize your leader, you highlight your leadership roles. The way that we typically do it is to italicize it and put it in front of uh, the program. So she was a section leader in clarinets in the marching band. She was a student leader at this leadership institute. She was an intern at Chick-fil-A. Um, she uh, was a youth ambassador at the church, president of 4-H, uh, founding member of an ACT prep club. And so those are the types of things that you need to plan for your resume. And this is Kimberly when she enrolled at Williams College uh, as the class of 2021. So that's an academic resume. All of you need an academic resume. The other resumes I'm gonna show, uh, you only need them if you're going to engage in a body of work that justifies a separate resume altogether to support an area of work. How many athletes are here? Raise your hand. Raise them high, I might be giving away a scholarship. All right, so these are all the athletes. If you're an athlete and you're a serious athlete, you must develop an athletic resume. Now, Lanier, what she did as a high school senior, she wasn't quite sure what she was gonna do, wasn't sure where she was gonna go to college, but she knew that she didn't want her mother to have to take out student loans. So what we did with, with Lanier, she said, well, she talked to my wife, my wife said, well, what are your gifts, what are your talents? She said, I don't know, Mrs. Wynn, I play volleyball. And so my wife said, well, do you have an athletic resume? She said, no, what's that? And so my wife sat down with her, and she helped her put together an athletic resume so that she could market herself. And that's what she did. She pulled this resume together, and then she emailed it to coaches, saying that, are you, are you looking for additional volleyball players for your program? Here's what I've done. One of the coaches that she emailed the resume emailed her back and she said, I'm going to come and watch you play. The coach came to one game and watched her play and there she is now. She's on the Brunel University volley women's volleyball team and her full scholarship is a balance of uh, athletic scholarship and academic scholarship. This all came about because she reached out. She was proactive. She said, coach, look, Come and look at me. She even got to keep her same number that she played 
uh, volleyball in high school. A performing arts. How many people in here are in the performing arts? In theater, or you write, or you dance, or you do stuff like that? None, no one? Oh, no one. Okay, just, okay, I got one, got two. You, if you have a body of work, you need a performing arts resume. This is one of our students this year, Shelby, uh, from Georgia. She put together a performing arts resume. She's reached out to colleges. She's identified all the colleges that offer auditions. Uh, and she has, she's been going through an audition schedule now across the country uh, trying to tally up her scholarship money. But again, the example that we provide on a performing arts resume is you put your educational background, uh, any programs that are unique to your craft, your performing arts credits, uh, anything you've done in the community, any competitions, and any awards. So again, you have that as an example. And then this is Lauren. Uh, Lauren. Many, many schools, they appreciate Lauren's body of work, but many schools, they don't go any further than education. When they read Lauren's resume, 4.649 GPA on a 4.0 scale, ranked number six out of 499 students, and an SAT score of 1570, I believe he missed one question on one section, another question on another section. They're so, now when they start, is it, if they actually spend time reading the resume, then what they, what they see is that he is involved in music and not only at his high school, but at his church. And again, I said Lauren's resume is three pages long because he is so accomplished. So here are the resume tips. You have to set goals consistent with the student profile of your first choice colleges. And we talked about that at one of the other sessions. How do you know what they're looking for? Because colleges publish a common data set. So you go and you pull up their common data set, and then on the common data set, it says what's important to them, what they value in admission. Then what you do, if you want to be offered admission to that school, you make yourself into the image of that student. And then you round out the edges with how you're going to be exceptional, and then align your colleges with who you are. Now, this is, I'll say this for all the parents. I know as a parent it's hard to tell our children the truth sometimes. But if you have a child going to school, making excuses about not doing the work, you have to keep pushing her or pushing him to turn in their work on time, to prepare for the tests or quizzes, then there are certain colleges that should not be on their radar. I'll give you this as an example. The resume you have, as an example, Kimberly's. She is academically brilliant. She left high school academically brilliant. She is one of the smartest young people I've ever met. What she said to me after her first semester at Williams College was that, Mr. Wynn, this is amazing. I am no longer the smartest person in the room. There are a lot of people a lot smarter than me. She got her first B ever. You realize for many students, they would go suicidal. Her first, I mean, I'm talking about not preschool, not kindergarten. She's never had a B in a grade in a class. And she got to Williams College and she got a B. And you know what she said to me? When she said, Mr. Wynn, I'm not upset. I earned that B plus. She said, Mr. Wynn, it is hard, but you know what? I was prepared. But what does that tell us about other young people? That if they're not prepared, that's not the place that they should be. Are you all with me on that? I know that's a hard, that's a hard conversation to have with our young people. But it's a, the truth, let me just get close to young people. The truth hurts, doesn't it? All right, the truth. How you guys doing in school? Good. All right. So <laughs> here's, here's our youngest son. And what I want all the people to think about, athletes, if you've been in a play, if you perform music, you need to do a supplement. And you need to have it ready before you begin applying to colleges as a high school senior. This is our youngest son when he did his supplement.
Now, our youngest son also played defensive end, but he got a lot more traction out of this than he did defensive end. You all can understand, you, you can probably imagine why, right? I mean, a lot of black guys play defensive end, right? How many, come on, tell the truth. How many of you have heard any, any black high school students sing classical music and play class, classical music? Do you understand that when his application went into the admission officers, got in front of them, they said the same thing that you all would say. Dang, do you see this? You see this brother? Man, look at what he's playing. That is how you distinguish yourself by following your own gifts. Sometimes that's hard because your gifts are not the same gifts that your friends have. So that is critically important. I want to transition into the essay writing timeline, but before I do, I want to ask if there are any questions about the resume, if I didn't cover everything. Yes, ma'am. How far back or too far back? Can you use middle You can use middle school stuff when you're in ninth grade because you haven't done anything yet. If you have an activity such as playing the piano that extends all the way back to elementary school, then of course that's going to be on your resume because while you are profiling your current involvement, your involvement is long-standing. But once you get into high school, generally after ninth grade, it's your high school activities and your high school awards that should be reflected. Uh, what I say is you can keep the middle school stuff, stuff on your resume until it becomes a full page, then start to nudge the middle school stuff off in place of all the high school stuff. Yes, ma'am. What about work experience? Oh, work experience is critical. Colleges look at your ability or a student's ability to work a job while they're in college and participate in activities uh, in very much the same as they would playing a varsity sport. They look at it as a time commitment. But the key thing with work experience is that students, they should get a high quality letter recommendation from their work supervisor. That will go a long way in supporting their overall college application. And I want to say, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I want students to understand this, that if your resume is full of work experience and weekend activities, that is not going to hurt you. Colleges are really looking for, how did you spend your time? And you heard one of the admissions officers from Amherst College say, if we have a student from a lower income background who has become accomplished in their grades and their test scores, we look at that, that student has an advantage. So the same applies to work. If you're working and you still are a, great, a good to great student, then that's gonna work to your advantage. But the key thing is, and in terms of letters of recommendation, if you attend a summer program, at the end of the program, ask someone to write a letter of recommendation for you, put it in your binder, put it in your file. If you're involved in a club or an activity, going back to middle school, ask someone to write a letter of recommendation for you, put it in your file. Um, if you know someone like me and my wife who are great at writing letters of recommendations, become part of their program or make sure that you're in that particular club because a great letter of recommendation, I, I can't stress to you the doors that it will open for you and not everyone is good at writing one. So that's why when you get a good one, you want to hold on to it, you want to use it over and over. Anyone on, with a question on this side? Anyone else over here? Okay, so on the essay writing timeline, I need for all of you to take the scholarship piece seriously. I need for you to begin identifying the scholarships that you know you want to apply for as a high school senior. And then I need you to create a scholarship table. I want you to write that scholarship down, the deadline, the criteria. And then when you've identified the criteria, you then want to make sure that your resume is going to reflect those attributes by the time you apply as a senior. Parents of juniors, the biggest problem we see every year is that they don't begin looking for scholarships until senior year. And while they're looking for scholarships, they're missing deadlines every week. And the big scholarships are easy to find. Now, 
I may refer to a $25,000 scholarship as a big dollar scholarship, but it's not really. Because when you, when you divide that by four, that's not a lot of money. But they're highly competitive. We have one of our Guilford County school students now who is a finalist for the Coca-Cola scholarship. Coca-Cola received 70,000 applications for their 150 scholarships. You stand a better chance of getting into the NFL, getting accepted to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Cornell, Brown, or Dartmouth, or Penn, than getting a Coca-Cola scholarship. So the reason you want to identify the scholarships early is you want to have them all identified that you're going to be applying to. Let me say this for the parents so that you understand this process. The most money your student will receive will come from the college. You cannot match a $60,000 annual grant with any scholarship money that's available. When you talk about a college giving you $60,000 a year, that's $240,000 over four years. There are a lot of scholarships you need to equal that money. So if you identify the most money will come from the school, then what you have to do is identify the schools that you're going to apply to and identify the money that that school offers. For example, one of our students here in Guilford County, and I mentioned this, I believe, at the last meeting, has already been accepted into Tuskegee and offered the Distinguished Presidential Scholarship to Tuskegee. That offer letter came in the summer. That meant the first school she was accepted to, she met the metrics. Now, what were they? Did, was Tuskegee concerned with this glowing resume, with all of these awards, with all of the leadership, with all the stuff that I've been talking about tonight? No. Tuskegee was only concerned with two things, GPA and test scores. So she identified the GPA and the test score required to get a full scholarship. She put that school on her list as a safety school. Do you realize what that means in college planning? When a young, per young person can say, this full scholarship opportunity, hey, how you doing, is my safety school. Can you, does it get any better than, can you imagine starting your beginning senior year and say, look, I'm a cruise. I've already been accepted and offered a full scholarship. So that's why you have to do this research early so you identify these schools uh, and then, in regard to your essay writing, you identify the schools and you begin working in your essays. Um, I want to be kind. So I'm trying to find the words to be kind. I work with hundreds of students from across the country. Most students no matter what their GPA and their test scores, they cannot write. Colleges intentionally trip up students in the writing questions. If you review many of the colleges, their writing supplements, and many of the scholarship essays, they will ask a question with two or three embedded questions in the question. They will say, Tell us about your most gratifying experience. Tell us why it was your most gratifying experience. Tell us what you learned from that experience. And tell us how that experience will enable you to, tr to change the future. Most young people will respond to the first question. My most gratifying experience was, and they're done. Boys are worse than girls. Because boys, by their very nature, use fewer words than women. Normally when you ask a guy how you're doing, parents, what does he say? Fine. You ask a young lady how you doing, well I'm doing fine, but you know, I don't understand so and so and so and so and my mother, I don't know why she was so upset this morning when she got up, and you know, I got all these AP classes and that is draining me. I mean, I am, I am really, I am, I am really wired up. You ask her brother, how's it going? All right. So, so what happens when they go to write an essay, they can't find the words. That requires a long time. So here's my suggestion for you how, you, how you work your way through that. You have to have a conversation with your computer. You just sit down and you look at your computer, 
and you just talk back and forth. I say to all young people, if you're writing a response to a 250 word essay, give me a thousand words. If I can get a good paragraph out of your thousand words, we can get some traction and we can start working. So the essay writing is critical. It takes so long. Now, here's the problem. Just like not wanting to come tonight, young people don't want to start the essay. And if the writing prompt is too difficult, they will put it off and they will put it off until the deadline. You cannot write a good essay when the deadline is five o'clock the day you start the essay. Now, what does that mean for, in the biggest scheme of things? What it means is everyone's time has been wasted. The counselor's time was wasted sending a transcript. Your parents' time was wasted reviewing bad writing. Your language arts teacher's time was wasted trying to uh, edit bad writing. The postage stamp was wasted by putting it on the envelope to send a bad application package in. The reviewer on the other end's time was wasted by opening up your application. The people in the room's time was wasted because they took the time to reject your awfully written essay and application. You've wasted the time of a lot of people, so let's stop it. If there's an application that's due next January, let's start that essay now. And let's work on it a little bit at a time, one paragraph a month, so that by next January, we have an opportunity to have a well-written essay. Complete all of your essays with writing responses prior to the beginning of the year. <sighs> for high school juniors and for parents of high school juniors, this summer is it. If you don't have college applications ready, if you have not written the essays, if you've not developed your college list, if you didn't hit your highest test scores by June, if you didn't become a leader before the end of the school year, <coughs> what's a kind way to say this? You're done. When you start 12th grade, it is anxiety filled. You have to keep your grades up. You have to stay on top of your activities. Doing all of that stuff, there is no time for college and scholarship planning and research. That has to be behind you. Before school starts, your timeline has to be, you need to know where you're going to apply to college. You need to know the admission cycle. You need to know if one of your schools is highly selective, that your best chance of being accepted is by applying early decision. You need to know that if you qualify for a diversity weekend invitation to a selective school, if you can get that invitation, those applications generally would be in the spring and no later than the summer. If you are invited to a diversity weekend at a selective school, your chances of being offered admissions multiply significantly. Here's the example, and I, I mentioned Brenna from Guilford County Schools last month. Brenna was invited to the Amherst College Diversity Weekend. She went, she applied early decision, she was accepted. The plan came together beautifully, why? Because Amherst College only offers admissions to 14% of their applicants. You saw the video, but they offer admissions to over 90% of the students who have already visited the campus through a diversity weekend. That means when they invited those 200 students to campus, where well, they paid all of the expenses to come, they were recruiting those students the way they were recruiting an athlete. And they were saying, we've already invested in you. Please apply. And if you apply, you're going to get in. So what I'm saying to you is that all of these plans should be in place by June. Now, let me deal with this issue of test scores. And where am I? Five minutes past. Let me make sure I get through through this, and I'm coming back to test scores. The common application, there's a website. When you create your common application account, you will see the seven essay prompts that uh, are in the current common application. Sometimes they might be modified from year to year, but you have seven choices. So which choice should you take? Most students want to take the easiest choice. That is not the choice you should take. 
You need to make the selection that is most aligned with who you are. Do you have a story to tell? Was there an event that happened that was traumatic in your life? You need to select the prompt that connects to your resume, to your recommendation letters, and to your overall body of work. So for example, if you're an athlete, you may select the prompt that relates to obstacles that you overcame. Maybe you had a torn, uh, a, a torn muscle, or maybe you had a broken leg. But whatever it is, you need to select the right topic, and then you need to allow time to write your essay. So your topic needs to be consistent with your core theme. What is it that you're promoting that you are? Why does a college want to accept you? Uh, develop a great essay that you can reuse in your scholarship applications. My personal preference is to develop an autobiographical essay that tells your story. Because many scholarships are going to ask you for an autobiographical essay, and an autobiographical essay is one that you can cut and paste, because in your life story, you're probably going to talk about obstacles, you're going to talk about unique issues you've overcome, you're gonna, and, and here are some of the things that jumped out of essays with students I worked with this year. One student diagnoses ADHD, but has perfect A's throughout high school. That became the core story. Another student, his father was tragically killed when he was two years old. He grew up in a single parent household with 10 siblings, and he was a uh, reading on a second grade le reading level when he entered middle school. But during the three years of middle school, he brought himself up beyond grade level, been a stellar student throughout high school. That is his core story. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is that you and your family, you have to sit down and look at that. An autobiographical essay may be painful. And also for, for parents, they may, it may, it may um, talk about issues that, uh, that are painful for the family. But you have to recognize that these are not essays that are being published on Newsweek or they're going to be on CNN. These are essays that are going to be in a room with a handful of people who you want to make a decision in your child's favor, so you want the essay to be compelling. Um, and then your recommendation letters should also support this overall thing. So before I, I entertain any questions, let me go back to this issue that I wanted to mention. What was the issue that I said I wanted to mention? Test scores. Um, commit to one test. It is foolishness to take the ACT and the SAT over and over. Commit to one test. Take a full length practice of both. Compare your scores. If your scores are higher on one, that should reveal the test you commit to. If the scores are close, then the question you have to ask yourself is, which test do I have the best opportunity to obtain the knowledge that's ne needed to raise my scores. And then you commit to that test. Now in committing to that test, you have to do two things. One, you should meet with your subject area teachers at your high school to close your knowledge gaps. Tell the teacher, I, on the math, I didn't know this. On the English, I didn't know this. On the science, I didn't know this. That's one. The second thing that you need to do is then identify either a YouTube video or a test prep company that will give you strategies unique to that test. So that when you're taking the test and you're running out of time, there are certain strategies that you're going to utilize. The timeline that you need to be on, you need to hit your highest test score by June of your junior year. Now I know that this is not consistent with what most people would say. What can I say? People disagree with me all the time. The reason that I say June is that if you do not have to commit your summer between the end of junior year and the beginning of senior year to test prep, you can then commit your summer to things that will help further define your brand. An internship, a pre-college program, a sports camp, a music camp, a leadership program, a piano camp, um, a voice camp. A, write, a creative writing camp. I mean, you get to a mission, a church mission. You get to submit, commit your summer to something that is going to look so extraordinary on your resume that you just can't wait until the end of the summer so you can write it down because it is just going to be that exceptional. 
You don't want to waste your time messing around trying to raise test scores. Now, if in June you don't get the test score that you want, in my opinion, you need to shift your focus to test optional schools. Now, when you are looking at test optional schools, ask yourself this important question. If they are not asking me for test scores, what else are they expecting? If you can ask yourself that question, then you'll come up with some really good answers. They're expecting me to have taken difficult classes. They're expecting me to earn high grades in those difficult classes. They're expecting me to have been a leader. They're expecting me to have demonstrated community service. They're going to probably expect me to interview, which means that's what you spend your summer doing, is ensuring that you are prepared to apply to those types of test optional schools. Now, right on time. Any questions?